So before I get into the content, I'm just going to talk about the, uh, the woman I've selected for my uh, hashtag RG Giants of Female. Um, and uh, her name's uh, Catherine Bonmuir, and um, I saw her speaking at a motorsport event this year, um, and was really inspired by what she's um, doing for the sport. Um, it's all comes back down to role models. So w within a, a sport that's dominated by, uh, by men, there aren't any female role models. Um, and I think everybody's got their role models and the people they aspire to be. And because they don't have them and have women that are role models in, in, in the sport, then typically that relates to, directly to sort of the women not getting involved and why there isn't any in, the, in F1 and, and other sports, other motorsports as well. Um, so I thought that was really fantastic. And I think it will potentially have an impact on um, not, just the, not, just, not just the sport, but also the engineering disciplines that are, are feeding into it. Um, so the first season actually completed this, this year, and I hope it goes from strength to strength. So, um, yeah, jump into the content now. Um, so I'm going to split my session up into two. Uh, the first one, first bit of it, I'm going to talk about uh, what, what CI is, just a brief um, overview on that. And then I'm going to share with you some results of a survey that I did um, before I put the presentation together. Um, then I'm going to go into some details about what we're doing with CI and our, what our process looks like. Uh, some of the challenges we had with that, the benefits we found. Um, and then I'll finish off by just talking about how we're going to evolve our process and the kind of things we want to expand um, uh, into. And then the second part, I'm going to, um, we're going to have a panel discussion. So I'm going to invite uh, four people from the community up here that have got some experience in continuous integration and have a chat with them about their challenges and what benefits they've seen as well. So CI, to me, is... Um, the process that enables you to highlight issues during the implementation or integration of changes in your source code. And, and the, the term continuous integration was coined by Grady Booch back in 1991. And it was kind of expanded through um, extreme programming, which um, advocated doing it more frequently, so more like multiple times per day. Um, and continuous integration can be expanded to continuous delivery, whereby at the end of your process, you've got something you can actually pass on to the customer that works. And then further on from that, you've got continuous deployment, which actually deploys that working code to a target, whether it's a, a web server or a or compact reel or whatever it might be. Um, so the reason why I did the survey, and uh, kudos over to, to Greg, because um, he I stole his idea on this one, so nice one for that. Um, the reason why I did it really was just to find out a little bit more about what everybody was doing in this area, really, and finding out what tools they're using. Um, so what it sort of uncovered was there was... From the, there was only 24 responses, so it's a relatively small data set, but it gave us a little bit of insight. Um, so 60% of the people that responded said that they used CI, which was quite interesting to start with, I guess. And the most popular tool was Jenkins, um, followed by GitLab and Azure DevOps. Um, and the team size of the people that responded that were using CI um, was pretty um, varied, so there wasn't anything that really stood out. Um, so the variation was from sort of single developers, um, up to sort of six plus team members. Um, and then from a project duration perspective, um, the people who were using CI were typically doing it on projects that were longer than 12 weeks. Um, so again, small data set, so don't know how much we can sort of glean from that. Um, so back to the 40% of people that said they weren't using it and some of the reasons why they weren't using it. And there was really two main points that came out of that. And that was to do with the time it was taking to actually set up and maintain a build server, um, and also understanding the benefits of it, really, and trying to justify it within small teams and small projects. But some of the benefits that people were sort of saying that they used from, from using CI uh, was that it gave you a much more robust process, build process. Um, and that really relates to the fact that everybody's doing the same thing. You haven't got people in, on individual machines building applications, doing tests. You've got a single process that's being executed by everybody, and it's the same. Um, I think the second one really is a, is a big one that we've probably seen the benefit from, and that's knowing exactly when and what has caused a build to fail or a test to fail. Um, and that's really critical, because you can easily then nail down uh, the exact VIs that changed during that commit that caused your build to fail, and then that really narrows down your area for debugging, as long as you're committing regularly, right? So if you're doing weekly commits, you might have a bit more of a challenge. <laughs> um, and the last one that came out was to do with efficient, efficiency improvements, and that was really related to automation. So 
Obviously, if you're automating your testing, automating your building, people aren't sitting there doing those tasks, so they can go off and do something that's more sort of value add. And then the, the challenges that people came up with that were using CI really relate back to the reasons why people aren't doing it, uh, which was quite interesting. Um, so a lot of time-related things, so learning the platform, learning how to do a particular function or integrate a particular thing into your process. Um, and then the other one was related to sort of convincing people of the benefits. And I think these two we can definitely relate to from our perspective, that at the beginning of um, our journey, we had loads of discussions, 2017, 18, and I was talking to David about this, and you know, we were saying, oh, CI sounds great, like a lot of people doing it, a lot of benefits coming out from that, um, we should be doing it. And it was really, at that point in time, the balance was off in terms of the amount of time that we perceived that we needed to spend doing it relative to the value that we perceived we were going to get out of it. So we really couldn't justify doing it. Um, so towards the end of 2018, in October, uh, Jörg did a remote presentation to our um, to a, a MLUG uh, meeting and went through his process of how he uses continuous integration and what, what tools and stuff that he uses. And um, I think for me, this underpins the value of user groups. It gives you the opportunity to listen to somebody's experiences, challenges, ways in which they've gone about doing something that you might be thinking about doing within your organization. So I think it's a massive um, push for that. I think if anybody's not involved in a user group, when you get back from this conference, really search it out and look, look out for your local one and get involved because um, the benefits are massive. Um, so yeah, then right at the end of um, 2018, we, we made the jump and we went for it. And really there was only, there was one main thing that was driving that, that jump and, and leap and to, to, to go for it. And that was related to how long testing was taking on a particular project. Um, so this was related to a specific project where we were delivering a route enforcement and traceability system for a production line. Um, and at the beginning of the project, we, we realized that we needed to be able to test this during development and also be able to test it during the maintenance period as well. So if we were making changes, we need to be able to test and validate it before releasing it, because if it cocked something up on the production line, then that's going to be costing the customer money. Um, so we started out, we had um, hardware on the desk, you know, we had an RFID reader, we had a barcode scanner, we had an operator's ID card, scanning that on the RFID scanner, great, we've logged in, scanning a barcode, great, we've registered that part against that, that work order, all that kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, it was really laborious, really time consuming. So we needed, we needed to evolve that process. And the way we went about that was to basically introduce a simulated production line. And that meant that we had to simulate every piece of hardware that was related to that production line. Um, so once we got all that in place, we basically were able to produce parts on that production line in a simulated environment. And that was great. And I think at this point, it's probably worth just taking a bit of breath and saying that I think process simulation and that element of simulation is really critical to enable us to get the maximum uh, benefit out of CI because without that it would have been a real struggle to be able to, to perform those tests within our continuous integration process. So I think those two things are quite um, heavily coupled. Um, so yeah, right, we've got this automated, oh, so we've got this simulated production line and we're able to, to sort of produce parts and test our system. But that process is still quite long because we've maybe got sort of 10, 15, 20 tests that we need to to perform. So that meant that somebody had to kind of do the test, find the result, do the next test, find the result, and so on. So that, that was probably taking kind of 30 minutes, 45 minutes to, to do. And if you're developing a function, doing those tests, and then realize that something wrong, you've got to go back and test it. So there's quite a lot of time that's being absorbed by that. So like I said, that's the real driver for the reason why we, we went for it. Um, so this is just a sort of real high-level overview of the tools we're using. So in the, in the office, we've got a PC, and that acts as our build server. And on there, we've got Jenkins installed with the GitHub plugin. Then we've got a couple of versions of LabVIEW to cover all the projects that we're using CI for. And then we've also got all the relevant drivers that, that sort of take all that up as well. And then we're using something called Ngrok, um, and that basically enables us to connect that uh, build PC up to the internet, and specifically enables us to connect it up to, to GitHub. So in GitHub, we've got webhooks, and the webhook is, talks to Ngrok, and then Ngrok maps that down to our, our build server. So whenever we push, webhook goes to Ngrok, and then Ngrok comes down to our build server and tells Jenkins to do something. 
And then the last tool on there is, is Dropbox, and that's just used for our distribution, which I'll cover in a little bit of detail in a bit. So I'm going to just want to cover a couple of terms that were perhaps on there. I appreciate people probably know what, what these mean, but just so that everybody's on the same page, really. Um, so the, the build server is basically our gold standard. It's kind of the, the environment where everything's stable and everything should work. Um, so it's kind of the, the, the gate to say whether it's okay to, to go to the, where, if, where, the, where the stuff happens to test to make sure that it's ready to go to site. And then the webhook is basically a, 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 an, something that enables you to, to two applications to talk to, to one another. So, so now, yeah, I'm just going to sort of delve down a little bit deeper in terms of the tools that we're using. Um, so we've got something, we've got a set of lab UVIs and batch files. And for the purposes of this, I'll call that the, the CI tool set. And that's actually been developed by NI and specifically the Veristand R&D um, team. And uh, Donovan Buck is one of the guys that's been sort of responsible for some of that development, the majority of that development. Um, and those guys are using it to sort of validate the custom devices that they're developing. Um, and that tool set is actually based on the JKI tools that were shown at NI Week in, in 2012. So we've got a few links in there that will be uh, live when I share the presentation. So basically, the batch files um, enable us to uh, run a build sequence. And that build sequence is effectively kept in a, a, a CSV file that's stored within the project repository. So for each project, we've got a, a, a build sequence that's kept in a file. And then the batch files basically enable us to connect up to that. So I appreciate that's still relatively high level in terms of what's going on. Um, but we'll dive a little bit deeper. And what I'm going to do now is just walk through um, our process uh, from start to finish and go into a bit of detail on what, the, what we're doing each step and the tools we're kind of using. So when somebody pushes um, a change to, to GitHub, as I said, that webhook gets sent over to Jenkins. And then Jenkins pulls the, the content of that branch for the repository onto the build server. And then the first step in our process is to, is to retrieve the build number. And the way that we're doing that is to use the Jenkins environment variables. So there's, there's loads of these that are very available um, and accessible throughout your build process within Jenkins. Um, but in this case, we're just using the build number to um, uh, retrieve, uh, to, to save that to file. And then later on, we um, uh, access that file and update our executable version number before we actually build the executable. Um, so that's, that's the, uh, the batch command that we're using to enable us to do that. So relatively simple approach, maybe not um, a typical approach, but we found that it was, it was quite easy, so we tend to stick with easy. So the next step in our process then is that the Jenkins calls the, the first batch file. So that one's called build.batch, uh, but sort of .bat, and as you can see, we just got another uh, batch command within our build process that, that calls that file. And that file looks a little bit like this, and basically what we do in there is we define the, uh, the versions of LabVIEW that we want to execute the process on. So we've got a minimum and a maximum build um, LabVIEW version, and then basically what it does is it loops through each version and it calls the second batch file. So that's kind of what I've got circled on the right-hand side there. It's executing the same thing for each version of LabVIEW. So then the second batch file is called, and from there, pretty much all that's doing is um, calling a, a, a build.vi, which is a VI which is within that CI tool set. So I think it's probably worth just pausing here for a second and saying that we're no way near experts in batch files. And in fact, we haven't made any changes to that CI tool set that we've um, taken from the, the, the NI guys. Um, so we've literally just taken a copy of that, and we're just using it within our process, which has been really good, because it's obviously trying to learn all this stuff is probably going to take a lot of time. So the build.vi is really where the meat of the work is, is going on. Um, and basically, the first thing that that VI does is it reads our um, build sequence. So that's called the auto build.csv. Um, and it loops through each task within that file. So this is a sample um, auto build file that I'm showing up here. And each row is effectively a task. And then what that task is is defined by the contents of that row. So you can see the first five rows there, uh, they all start with VI. And that basically means that we're calling a VI. 
Um, and the only other thing we need to define for that is the path where that VI is stored. So then the next two tasks are building executables. Um, so we need to define where the project's stored. Then we need to define which target the build spec is under, and then the name of the build spec. Um, and then the final command in there is basically a message back to Jenkins to say that we don't want it to delete any of the artifacts or builds that it creates as a result of the process because we need them to transfer over to our remote location later on. Um, so obviously you can do a number of, number of things and we're doing a lot of our um, testing by just calling VI. So that's the majority of the, the work that we're doing. So this is basically an example of one of the, the VIs that we're calling and you guys can probably read that. But in, in essence what we're doing is we've got a, a VI analyzer configuration that's stored in our project repository where we're running that uh, configuration, and then we're passing the results, and then only if we have any failures, we report those back to Jenkins. Um, so again, I think it's probably important just to just pause there a second and say that this process works in a way that if a task fails, it aborts the process. So it won't move on to the next step if it fails the, the, one, the previous one. But if everything's okay, it'll just carry on through. So we only, we only report back failures, and that applies to every one of the VIs that we're using. So that leads on to the next um, part of the process, which is basically uh, feeding that information back to Jenkins so that we can uh, sort of debug stuff. And we kind of see that in two um, formats. The first is kind of through like a command line type interface within Jenkins. So you can, in there you can sort of see exactly what's going on. And this is kind of an example of what that might look like. Um, but we also wrap that up into a, well we don't, but Jenkins does, uh, wraps it up into a text document and then, um, um, and then we um, send that with an email uh, out to everybody, well, all the relevant project members. Um, so as you can see with this example, um, this is reporting that we've had a VI analyzer test that's failed. And specifically, it's the VI documentation that's failed. And then it's failed within the main.vi. So that really narrows down the, the, where we need to go to resolve the issue. And then the final step in our process is that we need to distribute stuff. So we need to share the information about what's happened during the process. Um, so again, if it fails, we don't um, have anything, we don't save, send anything to the remote um, location. Um, but we do two things at this point. So we send an email, and then if it's a successful build, we distribute the build files or whatever's come out of the process. So the, the emails can give you messages of joy or messages of sorrow, depending on where you're at. And uh, we've had the, the full range. Um, so Jenkins works in a way that it needs stability to be successful. So um, the sex successful ones come once you've got a number of successful builds. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, yeah, the successful emails are wicked. I enjoy getting those ones. The failure ones are good because it gives you a point that you need to then go and do something. I think that probably raises quite a good point or something to remember is that if you're working in a team, and you're getting these failure emails, you really need somebody who's responsible for addressing the failures. So um, it's all right sending those emails, but there's no one doing anything with them. It's pointless. So I think it's quite a crit critical step to make sure that someone's been identified that's responsible to, for not necessarily resolving it, but picking it up and sorting it out or getting the right people involved to solve the problem. And like I said, the next step of that, um, that last part of the process is to distribute our uh, the results of the process. So there's a number of ways in which you can do this. Um, you can use a plugin. There's the Copy Artifacts plugin that's, that comes with Jenkins, and the, the, little, the bit of research that I've done into that, it seems quite intuitive and quite an easy way to, to implement it. Um, and that will basically transfer something from uh, your build server to a remote location or a, a location that you define. Um, you can also use Azure Blob Storage, or you can upload it to Azure Blob Storage. Um, and I'm sure there's a number of other ways you can do it. Um, but we, we chose Dropbox and a few reasons for that, really. Um, it was quite convenient. Um, we were able to then access it off-site, on-site, or wherever we are. Um, and it, it was just quite a neat solution. So what that ends up being is we have a builds folder, and then within that builds folder, we've got a, a folder for each of our um, Jenkins projects. And then within those projects, we've got a, a folder for each build. And then within there, we'll have the executables or whatever comes out of the process. So that kind of wraps up the, how we're doing it at the moment and the tools we're using. Um, so I'm going to go into a little bit about the challenge we've 
challenges we've had. And we haven't really got many technical challenges that I'll share because I think it's too difficult to get that across in a presentation. But um, broadly speaking, I think the, the challenges at the very start were just trying to understand which tool to go for, uh, so where to start. You know, there's lots of people using lots of different tools and doing lots of different things with these tools. So it's trying to filter that out a little bit to try and work out which one's going to do what you need and just something to get started on. And I think what I'd recommend is just try and pick a little task and try and get that working and then slowly sort of build up on that. Um, and I think the other one that we can relate back to the survey results really as well is understanding the value. That was really quite a difficult thing to understand because you know there's going to be a time commitment to it and it's kind of one of those things that you just can't really predict. Um, so I think when we had something that was quite specific, that was quite easy, easy for us to say that, you know, if we implement this, we're definitely going to get some value out of it. So we're willing to commit that time. So the balance was in our favour at that time. Um, the next challenge was really getting used to Jenkins. And I think uh, for us, maybe that was a bit of a nicer challenge than, than others, but because we quite like and in, in, enjoy getting used to new, new toys and learning how to do stuff. Um, but it takes time, uh, not just to learn the platform, but also to learn how to do all the different uh, functions that you want to do. Um, and then it's kind of a case of understanding what's possible. So what, what's your limits and what's the best way about of doing things? Like I showed with the um, distribution stuff, like there's loads of ways of doing it, which one's the best? And again, I think it's just a case of picking one and going for it, trying it, see what happens, and then if it doesn't work for you, change it. Um, and the, the last one is kind of more in the here and now. So now we're doing it, um, we understand the value, we start thinking about how we can improve that. Um, and then again, it comes back to time. So how do we find time to deliver that? We've got projects to deliver, so I don't really want to stop delivering projects and start working on my process, but at the same time, I know that if I start working on my process, my projects will become potentially more efficient and, and to be delivered in an easier manner. Um, so it's finding a balance, and I think what we do with this one is try and um, really focus our downtime on uh, when we've got gaps between projects, really trying to get a prioritised list of things that we want to focus on and then really picking them off as we have time available to do it. As you probably guessed, uh, we found that it was so worth it, and it, it's been a real uh, good step for us. Um, and the first one, a lot, of, some of these reflect some of the outcomes from the, the survey, but I think one of the big things is being able to identify the commit and the VIs that potentially caused the, your build or your test to fail. That's a, that's a really big one. Um, and again, we can relate to the automation thing um, because that was kind of the main reason we did it. We needed to reduce that test time, uh, or that the time that people were spending on tests. Um, so automation has been a, a key benefit for us. Um, being able to distribute the files as well remotely is, is great because it, previously perhaps people were building stuff on their machines, getting onto a USB stick, taking it onto site or doing whatever, whereas in this way, if that guy goes off sick for a couple of days, someone else can pick it up because it's in that remote location where the build's uh, being distributed to. Um, and I think some of these maybe are a little bit more, uh, or less obvious, sorry. So if you've got multiple executables in your project, um, your build process, you can just build all of them. Uh, whereas in, in reality, in, in a manual approach, you probably only build the one you need. So you'd make some changes for a relevant uh, executable, and you build your XC. It's working great. I'll take that on site. And then what you didn't know is that you've affected one of your other executables, and that that's caused you a problem. Two, three months down the line, you want to come and build that other executable. It now doesn't build. You've then got to try and work your way back through stuff to see oh, what have I changed, familiarise myself with what I was doing at the time, all that kind of time wasting. Whereas through the CI process, you'd get a build failure and then you'd be able to solve that problem there and now. So I think that's quite a, quite a good one that we found. Um, I think we've got the classic statement that it, it works on my machine. We've now got this gold standard where we can say, well, does it work on the build server? If it's a no, see you later. So um, that's, that's been really beneficial. Um, yeah, we, we mentioned the one about testing time. Um, and I think it, the, the next one really is about um, field analyzer. And because we've got it in our CI process, we're not relying on developers to run the VI test, the analyzer test. So we can integrate that into the, the process and therefore take it away, take the responsibility away from the developer. And this is probably somewhere that we haven't really utilized it significant, significantly, but it's something that we definitely want to work on. And another one that's kind of not so obvious as well is that I think. Um, Coming back to the simulation stuff, really, uh, as well, um, I think our approach to design and software development is more focused around trying to get something that's testable, because we know if we've got testable code that it's going to implement a lot better into our CI process. So it's kind of given us a slightly different angle when we're looking at design and, and software development. 
Um, so that's kind of a peripheral to a benefit that came out of it. Um, so these are some of the things we're, we're thinking about working on in the future. I mean, we've made a little bit of progress. I'll say we. David's the one who's done quite a lot of this, so I can't take all the credit, unfortunately. Um, so we're, we're looking at being able to build and distribute packages instead of just executables. So what I mean by that is that we can actually package up the XE with all the drivers that you'll need to then um, install it for the first time or install it on a new machine, etc. Um, also looking at wider distribution and sort of how we can use tools like System Link. Um, to sort of distribute our applications after the process is completed. Again, I mentioned putting a bit more focus on VR Analyzer and trying to build that up. Um, it'd be really cool if we could test the executable. So we've had a problem in the past where we've built the executable, build's been fine, that's great, and then we run the XE and we've got an error. So it'd be great if we could, following the, uh, the successful build of our executable was actually to launch that just to make sure that it loads and we, we get a, an er a no errors. Um, I think it's probably a bit too far to go to try and sort of run various aspects of the functionality, but at least we can say that it, it runs and we haven't got any errors on load. Um, and the last one there is really to look at how we can start integrating um, multiple repositories. So we have projects where we maybe develop a C-sharp um, solution and a, a NavView solution to be delivered to a single project. So it's trying to work out that if I commit a change to my C Sharp project, how can I then run my process on my, uh, my other repository? Because I want to run all my integration tests that uh, I've got in my, my LabVIEW environment. So obviously I can't, uh, we'd have to copy all that source code over to that repository to try and do that. So we're trying to work out how that might work. And anyone with any ideas on any of this, I'd be really interested in having a chat about it. Um, so yeah, I'm going to wrap things up there. I'm not going to take questions now but we'll have some time for questions uh, at the end of the panel. Um, so store them up and then we can perhaps pick them up in a bit. Um, so yeah, I'd like to ask everybody that's involved in the panel just to grab a seat and then we'll, um, we'll get the panel started. I think we should have a couple of microphones. I think the girls have got them uh, on the side there. Let me grab my bit of paper because otherwise I'll be uh, lost. Okay, so first of all guys, just um, for everyone's benefit, I guess, if you could just 30 seconds, quick intro, um, maybe a little bit about what your what tools you're using with CI and sort of why you sort of took the step to go for it. James, you want to kick that off? Okay, yeah, so my name is James McNally, Biosyn Technology. I um, first came across CI, I saw a recording of that NI Week talk and I thought, that looks a bit clunky, let's make a Jenkins plugin and that will get me to CLA Summit in Paris. And I didn't, so I never finished it. <laughs> but it, it, it gave me a lot of food for thought. And over time, I've been working on a CLI interface to, to, to try and make it easier. And so now I have a setup using Jenkins, calling through GCLI and some tools I've written on top of that to automate, in theory, all of my projects. But it's a work in progress, but it's going pretty quickly. Uh, so my name is Sam Taggart. Uh, because you just let me talk. Um, anyway, um, right now I am using GitLab for uh, CI. I find it a lot easier to use in Jenkins. Um, I did a presentation at an I week on it. And actually, I'm doing a webinar at the end of the month. So if you want to watch that, come uh, talk to me afterwards. And uh, yeah, right now I'm just using it mostly for VI Analyzer and unit testing. Uh, I want to get way more sophisticated, as you saw in my last presentation. I just have not gotten there yet. So. Uh, mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Chris Roebuck. Um, I decided to investigate CI after I realized I was drinking too much coffee while waiting for my test stand builds to complete. Uh, I use uh, Atlassian Bamboo uh, primarily because I already use Jira, I already use Bitbucket, and they offered me some really nice pricing on the Bamboo server. Hi, I'm Jörg Hampel. I also use GitLab. Uh, not for continuous integration, actually, but for automating releases because I keep and kept forgetting what to do to get the right package to my customers. Cool. Nice one, guys. So what I want to try and do now is really pick up on some of the challenges that we I, I got back from the survey and, and perhaps expand that a little bit onto some of the discussions we've having, been having previous to this. So I guess the big one that everyone's been talking about is sort of time. So the time it takes you to learn stuff is a bit of a pain and it's stopping people doing it. So... Any advice or little, I appreciate it's a really difficult one to try and help people with, but is there anything that you can think of that would give people a bit more 
Use GitLab. <laughs> I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> so genuinely, yeah. So, is it uh, actually, I started uh, trying to use Jenkins, I think, in 2013. And uh, technically, I made it work because it would do something, but it just did not help me at all because yeah. it was too clunky. And uh, uh, I stopped using it. And then when I started again to use or to try and do CI with GitLab, it was a much, much nicer experience mm -hmm. for me. Yeah. So I think nowadays it's much easier because there's so many tools out there and a lot of documentation. And also all of the things have gotten better and easier now. So I don't know how it is today. But uh, like uh, five, six years ago, it was really hard to get Jenkins up and running. I, I can kind of echo that because I recently, I, I, I've been working with Jenkins for a little while and I thought I want to try these other servers because I travel with these guys a lot. <laughs> well, let's see if it is as good. And in the end, I still settled on Jenkins because it's so powerful. And, I, and I've, like I said, I've been touching on it for a few years, so I was fairly familiar with the concepts. Um, but without a doubt, uh, I tried GitLab and Azure DevOps as well, and they're certainly much simpler to get started. Um, it, it's, it's much easier. So uh, if you're by yourself, if you're a single developer like me, uh, look for something that is self or that's uh, hosted, right? Like GitLab is hosted. I don't have to set up servers. I don't have to do any of that IT stuff. I mean, if you got an IT department and they'll set everything up for you, then that's great. That's worth thinking about. They, sh they still should set up GitLab locally. <laughs> I guess yeah, because I, 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 we, I've obviously gone through how we've gone with um, with Jenkins, and to be honest, I think David, you maybe agree with this, but I, I, I think we found it okay. Like, I don't think it it didn't feel too time consuming to get to a point where we could build an XE automatically and run a VI, and whether that's because we were using that CI toolset that I mentioned or. I think that's probably been the key, because otherwise we would have to done a shed load of stuff to try and get that stuff working. So I think that the key for us with Jenkins was to utilize that tool set. And there's some really good documentation that goes along with that as well, um, that walks you through how to do it. So yeah, I, th I, can, I can see where you're coming from with the environment side of things. I think Jenkins it does feel a bit kind of clunky is probably a good word for it. Um, but I think through what we've done, it's made it easier, if that makes sense. Yeah. I think the yeah the, the tool set is the other really big part of this, and that's what I've spent an awful lot of time on the last few years working on GCLI and and, and tools on top of that. And so obviously I want to plug <laughs> plug that a bit, but the I think that's part of the challenge is when you first come to it, you're trying to learn the tool set and you're trying to learn Jenkins. So hopefully it's kind of maturing, but um, the, the the tools that I've been developing now it can be installed with a single VI package. Uh, and I've taken some notes on what you were doing that I think will improve it further. <laughs> um, but that's a huge part, and I think as a community as well, we've got to develop the documentation yeah. to do that. And, yeah. and that's so key because it isn't hard, and you shouldn't need to understand the whole thing first time. You yeah. just want to say, you should be able to just go, right, install a system, run this script, don't worry about what it's doing, and, and be running. Yeah. And I think as a community, we can get the tools to that point. Yeah. If you're interested in that, come to my webinar. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I would say as well, if you're already using the Jira, uh, the Jira Confluence Bam, uh, Bitbucket toolchain, then Bamboo works really nicely. Uh, but it does kind of lock you into that ecosystem. If you then want to migrate away from Bitbucket, then Bamboo doesn't play so nicely. So mm -hmm. something to be mindful of if you want to get locked into a, a, a specific ecosystem. Actually, uh, Azure DevOps and Jenkins both integrate really nicely with Bitbucket and, and Jira. I was impressed. I thought it would be a lot more separate. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's that's good. Um, some some good ideas on there to sort of get people thinking. I guess. Um, I guess one of the technical things, perhaps, that we had a little bit of discussion about on, on Slack was about how you manage different versions of LabVIEW and also different versions of dependencies or different yeah different versions of dependencies. So, anybody got any golden nuggets on that one or <laughs> any thoughts? Uh, for LabVIEW, I use a different virtual machine for each version of LabVIEW and potentially for each project if I have other drivers that I need. Mm -hmm. And then for dependencies, I tend to use uh, VIPC files a lot. Oh, okay. And occasionally I'll use some uh, get submodules depending on the situation. So that seems to work for me. A combination of tools. Yeah. So again, it comes back to the tools you're using to get the job done, I think. It's, there's a bit of a theme there with the stuff we were talking about earlier before. 
I think the big thing with this is it's automation, right? So you have to have something to automate in the first place. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and that's part of getting those tools together as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because I think with our, with our management of different LabVIEW versions, we have to manually install that LabVIEW version on our piece, build PC, manually in install those, the, the drivers that we need, and then we're, we're kind of up and running. And yeah, it feels a bit clunky, but it kind of isn't that difficult because can just, we can just walk over to the PC and install it and leave it kind of thing. But I mean, yeah, horses for course, I guess. How about you, Jörg and Chris, any comments on that one? Um, we don't use we are PC files. Uh, we have um, we do use uh, Git sub modules, yep. but for the things where we have external uh, dependencies, we have one build step that just clones other repositories to like locations uh, okay. relative to the ones that we built. Yeah. But then the thing is, you need to remove those from the build results again because LabVIEW just always builds all the dependencies into the into the thing that you built. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of not ideal, but it does work for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Um, okay, um, so picking up on what we came back from the survey, which was that people couldn't really understand or uh, justify or un yeah, understand what the benefits were within small projects or small teams. So Sam, you alluded to the fact you're, you, you're working as a sole developer. Um, anyone doing CI on small projects that can say you should be doing it on small projects? For me, I think I, we would probably just do it anyway, I think. Yeah, I think we would just we'd just do it because it's it's just a case of setting up the Jenkins project and then kind of where you go. It doesn't really once you've done one, you can do. All. That that was going to be my comment. There's some inertia over that first hurdle. Yeah. Right. So to set it up for one tiny project doesn't make sense. Yeah. But once you get a medium project and you set it up for it, you can use it on small yeah. projects really easily and reap all the benefits. Yeah. yeah so yeah. the key is finding that one project. It just justify just enough to justify that. It's getting that balance, you, the balance right where you're going to get the value for the Once you build the tools time. and pass the learning curve, for me on a new project, setting it up is really simple yeah. at the moment. But, yeah. Yeah. but it's not always worth it. Like in the presentation I did, it wasn't really worth it for setting it up for that. So, yeah. so it's, it's a trade off. There's been some unexpected benefits, I guess, for myself. So my CI helper tool, thank you, James McNally, um, <laughs> for his command line tools. Um, my CI helper tool, what I realized is that I could actually benefit from it locally before I've actually pushed to the server. I could use a Git hook uh, to call my CI helper to run a, a, a smaller VI analyzer config to actually do some local checking before the code actually hit the repo. So things like your example, Chris, where you said it failed because no VI documentation. Yeah. Just basic things that you just, you don't want that in your repo mm -hmm. before you've actually you pushed. Yeah. So being able to use that same tool chain locally and on my build server. Mm. Yeah. Thank you for inspiring me because I saw your talk and that's next on my list of projects to do is to make mine run locally and put a nice GUI. Jorg also has a nice GUI that he runs locally. I just want to say that we have a GUI that just calls the same things locally because sometimes you want to build something at your customer and either you don't have internet connection or you don't want to wait or whatever. Uh, okay. So we can just create the EXE on site. Yeah. And also, I think it's not a question of the size of the project, but rather how often you want to build that. Yeah. Because uh, it doesn't matter if it's big or small. And uh, for the workshop we had yesterday, I uh, created a, a new repository in a new project, and it took me like two hours. And 1.5 hours of that was me doing something wrong. So it's yeah. it's really easy to set up. That robust. So that's not really a hurdle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I think the bit that surprised me as a solo developer as well, I, I kind of figured the value would be low. I do unit testing, so I knew it would automate that, and I do forget to run them. Uh, and I kind of want to start using VI Analyzer. So, well, while I'm here, I might as well make it build the executable. And I thought that was going to be a waste of time, frankly. But it caught so many issues, mainly with missing dependencies, my dependency file, I used the IPC files, but they weren't up to date. Um, and actually, that's really gone, huh, this is really valuable. And, and to echo your point, you know, when you've got a main XC and a few utilities, I had several projects where I had utility ones that wouldn't build that I hadn't realized because I hadn't yeah. tried for a while. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's definitely turned out more valuable than I expected. Yeah. I think some of this discussion has also picked up on a point that I had a chat with a couple of people uh, last night, I think, or today, throughout today, is that people within perhaps big corporations will struggle to maybe get your IT department to 
set you up a server where you can put Jenkins on or whatever. So having that local option gets you some of the way to having something of a process, I guess. Um, although if you're working in a team, that becomes more of a challenge, I guess. You might have to have it on everybody's machine. So then, uh, well, I don't know how that would work and how IT would go about that as well. So I don't know whether you guys got any experience of big corporate. I guess, Jörg, you do it at one of your customers, right? And they're corporate. Uh, well, for one thing, if you have a tool, everybody would do it the same way. So it's still a benefit, even if, yeah. you, have, if you have to copy the tool on the machines. That's yeah. not too big of a hassle, I think. Yeah. And yeah, I think one of the benefits of CI for us was that we, uh, last year, we um, we kind of sold the uh, service of getting one of our customers to use that process. And this year, it looks like we can uh, sell the tools, actually, as a product. Yeah. And that was not really planned, but yeah. uh, I won't say no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice one. Okay, um, we've got four minutes. Is there any questions from the audience? We've got a couple. I haven't got any mics. Can I grab that one, James? Yeah. Couple behind you as just, well. just a very quick one. What's the best way to learn GitLab? Where's the best tutorial? Pass it behind you. I was just going to say, come to my webinar. It's uh, <laughs> August 26th. So uh, if you don't know how to go sign up for that, you can look on my website or just come talk to me. I'll get you information. Yeah, it's got something to say on the end. I think the right answer to that would be hire us. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> no, uh, actually, it's uh, like with all things, just start using it, I guess. Uh, I'm not sure if the documentation is something that you want to read like uh, uh, before going to bed, but I think it's, mm -hmm. fairly, it's fairly good if, you, if you're stuck in certain places or just like talk to the guys, go on Slack. Oh, uh, the GitLab documentation is awesome, but don't search on their site, go to Google. It's kind of like the NI search engine. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, Leah? Hiya, um, I was just wondering about your approach to um, VI Analyzer with CI and um, what subset of the tests you run and which were the most useful and things like that. So, uh, I, this is one of the reasons I actually end up sticking with Jenkins. Um, so what I do is, is I have a configuration with like high, medium, low. And my, the way I treat it is nothing high should go through. There are things that fundamentally, uh, something's probably broken, and the others I kind of let through. And the reason I mentioned Jenkins is there's a plugin which can take a check style format, which is a package for generating from VI Analyzer. And on that, you can then configure it, and you can say, make the build unstable if there's this many high errors, or, uh, or break the build if there's this many high errors. And so then it's a bit more configurable as well. Um, and I run the full set on the CI server. It can be a bit slow, and I'm still figuring that out. Yeah. Um, but I kind of figure that's the place to do the full set. But I make sure I do it late in the process. So if the unit tests are going to break or the build's going to break, it's going to do that quicker rather than doing VI, VI Analyzer up front and delaying everything by 20 minutes because the fast feedback's really useful. Yeah. James, your blog post. Do you have a blog post on that? I do have a blog post on that. I, <laughs> 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 Come find my blog. <laughs> So right now, like I want to do a better job of just running VI Analyzer tests on the VIs that have changed. I haven't implemented that yet. Uh, right now, I just have it running on the entire project, and I have it run every time I check in. I, ha I need to sort the priority stuff. But one thing I noticed, and this is something you may run into, is problems with fonts on different computers are a pain in the uh, And uh, they will pass on one computer, not another. So. As a way to get rid of those nuisance things, I put in a limit, and if like more than X number fail, then it sends, then it uh, stops the build. Otherwise, it just sends you an email. But a nice thing about that is, if you inherit a crap project, you could put, you know, you run VI analysis, you get a thousand failures. You put a thousand in there, and then you, you know you're not adding any more stuff. And then as time goes on, you can lower that number and get down. Uh, I don't know that you'll ever get it to completely pass. Um, I mean, it depends on how selective you are yeah. with your tests. I did have some that was passing everything, and then I noticed they were failing over the fonts thing. It was driving me nuts. VIN um, VIN yeah. yeah, the VIN ignore is a game changer. Before that, I wouldn't even bother trying. Now that you have VIN ignore, you can ignore stuff. And so. The fonts, yeah, I do need to do that. So that was something I took out of yesterday that I haven't. I need to go write that down. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. No, actually, I need to repeat it because I need to not. Since I'm not going to be able to write that down right now, I need to remember <laughs> that, so I go back and watch this. Uh, 
Fab was saying that if you can change the LabVIEW INI file and set it to a standard font, and what was the other thing? You can do that in a VIPC file, so you apply the VIPC and get it. What was the other thing, or was that it? Oh, VIN ignore, yes. I think I talked about that, so I think. To get back to the original question, uh, <laughs> Paul Morris presented, uh, I don't know when, about uh, the process of getting a team together, and he also touched on the topic of GitFlow and where you would have different phases in implementing a feature and then merging it somewhere and then releasing to a different branch. So those would be like uh, points where you could execute different VI analyzer configuration files so that if you like uh, closing your feature, that would be maybe a more lightweight test. Whereas if you do a full-blown release, you would have to have something more thoroughly executed. So that would be one way to go about things. And on the build server, run the full the full suite against everything on my local um, commit, commit hook, run a subset, a very small subset, because you want that fast turnaround, but you want to catch the big things uh, and only run that unchanged files. We're, we're running Is there any reason not to only check the changed files? No, the other way around. We always check only the changed files, not the full set. Uh, the main reason is just because you haven't implemented it yet. It actually <laughs> requires some effort to like pull the things out of Git and figure out which ones have changed. Okay. And also, then you've got to use the VI Analyzer API instead of just passing it. Because, uh, I mean, if you use the, sorry, the LabVIEW 2018 CLI tool, if you use it out of the box and you call VI Analyzer test, then it's like statically testing whatever you have defined in there, which is quick and easy to get up and running, but uh, not as useful as it could be. We're running over, so I know you had your hand up for quite a while there. Um, so we'd have that last question, and then we'll close yeah. up. I'm just wondering, uh, how do you deal with the hanging GUIs and uh, pop-ups and these kind of things and yeah. builds or slaves? So, I have some new information, which I Googled since I saw it in your slide. There is a knowledge base on the NI site that popped up in April uh, that has a list of a load of INI tokens, which will try and block most of them. Fundamentally, I th it's... We need NI to make it possible to, to run it without it. I don't know whether those tokens are enough. <laughs> but this is it. So it's figuring this out and working with NI on that. I mean, I think the advice I would have with that as well is if you can, set up your CI server to um, auto log on Windows and launch LabVIEW as a user so then you can see when it hangs at least. Because if you run it as a service, which is how most of them install by default, that will happen, but you'll never see it. So I think trying to prevent it and running it that way so you can see it and understand why it's hanging when it does uh, is the best advice I have right now. But I'm going to go try these INI tokens tomorrow and uh, let, I'll let you know. <laughs> that won't help the uh, package manager trying to update itself. <laughs> that you, yeah, so, so and that's the other thing, go through the menu. So VI package manager disabling like all of its startup checks and things like that. It's, it's kind of a bit finickety and at some point we need to write a good A to Z of, you know, <laughs> here's what to set to, to minimise that. Yeah. Great stuff. Well, first of all, I thank you guys for uh, the effort on this and really appreciate your time on, on the stage. And um, thanks, everyone, for the questions as well. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>